Your 20s can be really strange. On the one hand, you're on the cusp of total freedom. You can finally decide the life you want to live, and you have less responsibilities than before. You might actually feel hopeful and excited for the future. And at the same time, you have almost too much freedom, with little guidance in what to do with it. There is a constant instability in terms of relationships and jobs as you try to figure out what sticks. You feel anxious on most days and hopeless on others. We've been constrained by this myth that you graduate from college and you start your life, writes Angela Neal Barnett, a psychology professor at Kent State University. This is true. There's a great deal of pressure in terms of getting things started. Even if you don't quite feel like an adult, the world expects you to at least play the role. But this can be really tricky, especially nowadays. The loss of a conventional college experience thanks to the pandemic, climate anxiety, student debt, and job insecurity can all be pinned as contributing factors to the desire and sometimes the necessity for many young people to delay committing to any one thing and starting their lives. This, however, may lead to what many experts are calling a quarter-life crisis, the developmental crisis that many 20-something-year-olds face as they are suddenly dropped into the real world. The quarter-life crisis is a free-floating and anxiety-inducing life stage. It entails the feeling of being locked out of adult commitments, such as finding the right partner or right job, or feeling locked into commitments that, deep down, don't align with one's identity. You may consistently make attempts to settle down and pursue life goals, only to suddenly feel overwhelmed and uncertain, jumping from one thing to another. It can all feel like trying to hit a moving target. You find the right person, but they're moving to grad school in another country, or you find the right job only for the business to go under. Or even worse, you find the thing that you were looking for only to realize that it's actually you that has changed along the way, and now it's back to the drawing board. Those in a quarter-life crisis tend to experience heightened emotions, despair, optimism, and curiosity. This may be demonstrated in the trend for many 20-somethings to use elongation in certain words in order to express emotional impact. One social media study also found that time was one of the largest focuses of those experiencing such a crisis. The researchers labeled this an optimistic preoccupation with the future. Namely, respondents were constantly thinking of the future in a hopeful and equally concerned manner, thus prompting dramatic emotions and actions to be taken. The respondents also used first-person pronouns often, demonstrating a relatively high self-focus compared to other age groups. Finally, the researchers found that topics such as exercise, travel, alcohol, and sports came up often as activities 20-somethings engage in in order to both cope and enhance exploration during such a crisis. Of course, the quarter-life crisis is often greatly influenced by external sources, such as society and family. This is forced adulthood, which is the traumatizing experience of having to engage in adult roles and responsibilities before one is capable of doing so. Here we may see some cultural differences. In one study, individualist cultures such as the US were shown to emphasize financial self-sufficiency in order to support oneself as being a sign of adulthood. In collectivist cultures such as India, financial self-sufficiency was also seen as a sign of adulthood, but was valued because it meant the child could now support their family or perhaps meet material expectations. Despite the differences in context and motivation, both groups felt the pressure of having to prove themselves. This is especially difficult in the face of rising student debt, where the means to achieve wealth, such as getting a degree, can be the very cause of failure. The cruel truth is that the quarter-life crisis is often intimately tied to privileges outside of one's control, as one researcher notes. In many ways, adulthood has become a psychological phenomenon achieved through striking a balance between one's own aspirations and care for others. However, life chances are still, for many people, linked strongly to social and cultural backgrounds, and the tension between this and the wish for self-determination can create a feeling of crisis in finding one's place in the world. If you're experiencing a quarter-life crisis, what then is in your control? 
Firstly, there are the basics. Many 20-somethings tend to neglect self-care and health, mostly in the service of social and vocational pressures. By checking in with yourself every three months, paying attention to what you are curious about, and making sure you are being patient with yourself, you have already established the necessary basis to navigate the adult world. Mindfulness, for example, may be a perfect practice to pursue at this time. Not only does it offer proper emotional coping tools, it also reduces the extreme focus on the self as well as the future that can cause such emotions. The next step is to ask yourself if, presently, you seek stability or meaning. One writer groups all quarter-lifers into two groups, stability types and meaning types. The stability types may prioritize security, but this is at the cost of a sort of emptiness. They may work a cozy and stable job, but it doesn't really fulfill them. And then the meaning types may prioritize passion at the cost of stability. To become a whole person is ideally to both pursue something that gives one meaning with the stability necessary for continued growth. The creative type may need to establish a routine, and the stability type may need to let loose and explore more. Finally, a crucial aspect of growing up is realizing that you never truly grow all the way up. Romanticizing rites of passage, like finally winning an award, or getting married, or having kids, may turn your present quarter-life crisis into a future midlife crisis. It is highly unlikely that one specific event or snapshot moment will solve you or make you happy for the rest of your life, and sacrificing the present in the service of these moments could just leave you with regret. Instead, embrace the fact that your 20s is when your brain is at its most ripe to form novel connections. Of course, these connections mean confronting uncertainty, which can lead to maturation. In doing this, that is, in exploring the world and yourself, you will come to know yourself better. You'll know what you want, and here it's important to think about what you want in terms of the lifestyle, rather than career or even partner. Instead of asking yourself, what are the big things I want accomplished by the time I'm 50, ask yourself, what would I like to be doing on a boring Thursday afternoon when I'm 50? What kind of a life do you want to live day by day? Because unfortunately, not everyone is going to get their dream job. To discover oneself is to embrace what the psychologist Meg Jay calls the unthought known those things we know about ourselves, but forgot somehow. These are the dreams we have lost sight of, or the truths we sense, but don't say out loud. Deep down, underneath all the nagging voices of our parents and friends, we do have an idea of what we want. Contrary to the opinion of most 20-somethings, the issue here is not one of a lack of self-knowledge, it's a lack of knowledge. The terror of uncertainty isn't being uncertain of what we want, it's wanting something but not knowing how to get it, working towards something without knowing it is a sure thing. This is true vulnerability, a journey into uncertainty, that is ironically the key to growing up. This video was sponsored by Blinkist. I'm a huge psychology fan, and I absolutely love using Blinkist to help me learn more about the subject. For those who aren't familiar with Blinkist, it's an app that offers condensed versions of over 5,500 nonfiction books and podcasts on a variety of topics in just 15 minutes. One of the things I love about Blinkist is that it allows me to learn about new ideas and concepts in a really efficient way. With this app, I can easily get through multiple books on psychology in a short period of time. Thanks to Blinkist, I've been reading Dr. Meg Jay's The Defining Decade, which offers practical advice for any 20-something who feels lost in life and is experiencing a quarter-life crisis, and it's all backed up by science. I highly recommend this book. Now there's a new feature called Blinkist Spaces, which allows you to create a space with friends or family where you can recommend titles to each other. All members of a shared space can access all titles in the space, with or without a Blinkist Premium subscription. Overall, I highly recommend Blinkist to anyone who is interested in psychology or just loves learning in general. 
You can get a 7-day free trial and 25% off Blinkist annual premium by using my promo link in the description.